Hi, welcome to Ed Talks. My name is Janae Nugent. I am a Board of Governors Teaching Chair at the University of Lethbridge. Oki Nitsu Kawawa, welcome to our friends and family. Uh, we are located on traditional Blackfoot territory, and today we are uh, getting to talk to the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Lethbridge, Dr. Mike Mann. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. <laughs> uh, so, we are lucky to have you here today. You don't often get to talk about teaching. You kind of maybe left teaching in your, yes. in your past a little bit at the University of Alberta. I'd like to start this conversation by getting to know you as a teacher, because I know sure. you as an administrator and as our president, but maybe as a teacher, what, you know, what are your, when you were teaching regularly, what were your main passions? What sort of drove you and motivated you in, in your teaching? Uh, it's a great question. And I, you know, I always start off when I talk about my teaching um, to really talk about the values that drove me, uh, frankly, into um, thinking about becoming an academic. And those values are really all about inclusion. So I, I was very involved as a young person working with individuals with disabilities, uh, both in community as well as actually institutional settings, uh, even in high school. And so that really influenced me as I moved into university to sort of look at the whole area of disability studies as um, something that, that I was interested in. In the earliest time, this was in the physical education context, and then I did my PhD in education. But all the way along, I was really interested in, in the whole concept of inclusion early on in relation to people with disabilities. But I would say the, um, uh, the influence of being involved in, in the disability studies world really influenced how that I then began to think about teaching and really using inclusion as a foundation to my thoughts about teaching. Uh, there's a great quote by uh, Henry David Thoreau, which is, uh, let them walk to the beat of a different drum, of a drummer, however measured or far away. And so that, uh, that quote has always sat in my office, I think for, I think as long as I've been an academic. And it's really about um, finding the right space for people to participate in whatever context you're involving them in. So uh, for me, as, a, as a, a faculty member, as a teacher, I use that throw quote as well as you know, the foundational uh, work in inclusion uh, to really influence how I then interacted with students in the classroom. And so you know, I, would, I would think about inclusion as, as, a, as both a concept from a, 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 a topical perspective, but also as a, as a method, as a foundational method. There's also a great um, quote by uh, a fellow named Bent Nierje, who is uh, uh, from Norway, and he wrote in the early 80s about the notion of integration as being based upon the word integrity, which uh, he said was um, the ability to be yourself amongst others. So that's sort of the second piece of the puzzle for me is, you know, the notion of inclusion, but at the same time, the notion of being able to be yourself amongst others when you are included in, say, a classroom context. And, and I've certainly seen that play out in, in all sorts of ways as a, as a as a faculty member, uh, you know, people with different learning styles, people needing different kinds of care and attention as students, even in terms of the whole process of uh, evaluation and grading and, and how different students react to that and, and engage with you as a faculty member. So that would be, I guess, my foundational thoughts about how I've been influenced as I've thought about instruction and, and being a teacher. Right, oh, that's fantastic. That um, really, works towards the heart of a lot of what the University of Lethbridge yes. is about, and particularly in our liberal education yeah. um, philosophies. And, and I knew that you had some, come from a background of volunteerism mm -hmm. as well. And so that fourth pillar where we talk about engaged global citizenship, that really sort of speaks to that as well, so. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, in my installation address, I talked about volunteerism as, uh, as something that had has, has had great influence in my life, both, um, you know, as a young person actually watching my parents who, who were very active volunteers and then as a, as a young person myself and then into adulthood, you know, the whole experience of being a volunteer and the extent to which that really had a, 
an extremely positive impact on me and how I think I've moved through my career. So as I've thought about, um, you know, as, a, as a, a young faculty member, as I thought about how to, you know, provide as, as broad an experience for my students as possible, uh, I, I, will, I always uh, thought about volunteerism as, a, as a, uh, an important cornerstone. And so, you know, a lot of the courses I taught, especially when I was really in teaching at the University of Manitoba, you know, teaching undergraduate and graduate students, um, volunteer experiences were built into a lot of uh, what I did uh, as a faculty member. Uh, and, um, you know, the students would, uh, you know, sometimes gripe, sometimes be enthusiastic, but I would say always, um, would be quite self-reflective after the experience about what they had learned through the volunteer experience um, in relation to the curriculum itself and what we were talking about uh, in the classroom. So for me, coming to the University of Lethbridge, um, you know, seeing and understanding the foundations of, of liberal education, um, and then also the, the really strong commitment to the undergraduate experience, you know, that really spoke to me as, as uh, as a faculty member, as an administrator. So, um, I, you know, I would say I really fell in love with the University of Lethbridge, getting to know it as I was thinking about um, applying for the job of president. And so since, since that time, over the last eight years, uh, I've really tried to promote this as, as part of who we are. And really pleased that, um, you know, with the um, revitalization of liberal education, uh, that that citizenship component and volunteerism as par a part of it is uh, so foundational to, to uh, how we see uh, trying to uh, provide experiences for our students. And so you must be particularly proud of the volunteer Lethbridge connection yes. that we've had recently. I sure am. You know, I remember actually, you know, the starting of that was um, visiting the volunteer Lethbridge offices and frankly seeing how bad they were and how they really didn't meet their needs as an organization space-wise, even the quality of space. And so as we started thinking about how we might work with them as partners, and then this idea of, of um, offering them space in the Penny Building in return for you know exploring how we as two organizations could come together to create a volunteer uh, sort of model for our students um, has been really gratifying. And now to see you know, the extent to which it's really taken off and this you volunteer as, as an approach is, uh, you know, exciting for me because I, as I said earlier, I just have personally found volunteerism to be such an important uh, experience for me, also for my own kids. My three kids have benefited greatly as I've watched them grow as adults. So I think um, if we can provide um, young people with an understanding of the importance of volunteerism, um, but also, uh, as importantly, the actual volunteer experience itself and the extent to which they learn through that experience, then I think we're, we're expanding their horizons and we're really setting them up um, for uh, their future. And then the other piece of this, and it really ties into um, the citizenship uh, pillar, is um, we also are contributing to the community. We're, we're having a whole cohort of, of people see volunteering as an important part of their future. And that, I think, is what civil society is about, is, is, is really generating the next generation of citizens that understand the importance of their role as contributors to the citizenry. It's very inspiring and uh, a great objective. Um, how does that go together then, do you think, with the need that universities need to be very practical and that yeah. we need to train people for a future and a job as well as being good global citizens? Yeah, understanding that, uh, you know, universities have multiple roles to play, I think, is important. And, and of course, we have roles in promoting scholarship and research. We have roles in, in creating experiences for our students in the classroom. And we have roles in, in helping students see uh, themselves in different contexts going forward in the workforce, et cetera. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a matter of creating balance in terms of, uh, of the sorts of things we deliver um, to our undergraduate and graduate students. And, um, you know, it's also a matter of choice. I mean, um, I talked earlier about my beliefs around inclusion and, and the notion of integrity and, and embedded that in that um, is uh, a real um, foundational um, valuing of choice as an important um, you know, human aspiration and, and human right. And so 
I think that um, part of what makes up a good university experience is creating an environment where students are given the, the opportunity as young adults to make choices as to how they're going to engage uh, on campus, both in the classroom, outside of the classroom, with their, their student peers, with their faculty, um, uh, faculty members, etc. Because, you know, going forward, um, they are going to have to make a lot of decisions in their lives. And so if we can create uh, multiple spaces for choice making as part of the, the experience for them, then I think we're really doing a service to them. And, you know, so again, I would go back and say that um, our, the, the, sort, the foundation of our, our curriculum, which has a big choice element uh, embedded in it, is a tremendous service to our students because it really is helping them to, to learn to make uh, decisions, learn to be choice makers, and uh, this, I think, is, is a big part of what helps uh, young adults become successful adults as they move forward in their careers, as they move forward as family members, etc. Also very inspiring that maybe people don't necessarily know a lot about is uh, that you and Maureen, your wife, had created a uh, scholarship and it's the my, it's the Man Family Athletic Award. Is it's that the a, yeah, it's a, it? you know that's a good question. I think it's called <laughs> the Man Family Endowment for 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 student athletes. And yeah, so the the uh, you know the sort of genesis of that is our number one our our belief in in uh, the importance of being role models in terms of giving because uh, of course one of the things I do a lot is uh, spend time out in the community uh, asking people to think about contributing to the university so that we can continue to grow as uh, as a university and so I think um, it's really important for um, for me for our family to be models in that area in terms of the the choice to um, you know, look to uh, student athletes. Uh, you know, I was a student athlete myself. I, I, I really uh, feel that I benefited greatly from uh, having the opportunity provided to me to uh, to play football and run track at the University of Manitoba. I think I grew as a as a young person, having to find that balance between uh, academics and athletics and. And at the same time, I, I was still very involved as a volunteer when I was a student athlete and student. And so, um, and in fact, that's you know how I moved into this whole world of disability studies. So as I've thought about my, my experience as a student, I was involved in the classroom, involved in athletics, and involved in the community. And so, um, and all three of those benefited uh, uh, me uh, greatly. And so, uh, I see many students attempting to uh, achieve the same thing. Many, many of our student athletes are doing some amazing things. I mean, uh, in fact, I'm humbled by them. I can't believe the, the kinds of uh, lives they, they live in terms of the contributions they make across uh, sort of multiple uh, settings. And so it's really a, an encouragement and celebration of, of um, you know, the aspirations of, of, of young people to, to find that that same experience of multiple pathways. And you know, if we can support uh, some young people in, in, in that endeavor, then, then uh, you know, I think we're, um, we're just helping a, a few more folks to be successful. Well, that's great. And do you feel that uh, that will have spin-off effects for the rest of the campus community? And uh, you know, some of the athletes might have a higher profile on campus, for example. And yeah, well, you know, I mean, I, I guess, first of all, I'd say as a university president that I think it's important for <laughs> students of all profiles to, to have high profile. And so our student athletes are, are, are students in, in drama and the arts, etc. Our students that are in our many different clubs that are, are, are doing some uh, amazing things. I mean, I look at uh, the group that created our WUSC um, mm. uh, group on campus uh, that brought uh, Syrian refugee student here. So, I, I mean, for me, it's about celebrating the breadth of, of uh, experiences that our students pursue. You know, I chose, we chose athletics because it's near and dear to our hearts. And it was uh, a way to um, sort of profile, yes, a, a group of student athletes. But I'm, I'm very quick to point out that, you know, I, I see the value in the cross section of experiences that our students uh, pursue. and. Um, just so proud of them, so many of them that, that, that do so many things. Right, yeah, really inspiring leadership yeah, on campus, absolutely. which is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the WUSC, which I yes. think is um, an amazing uh, project. Uh, Aaron Phillips and Ann Diamond have been really instrumental yeah. in terms of um, 
university employees that are championing this, but the West Group is also really great yeah. uh, in bringing refugees to campus. So far one, but yes. with aspirations for more. Yep. Uh, internationalization is something that you've been talking mm -hmm. about a lot on campus, and I wonder if you might talk to us a little bit about why internationalization is an important priority sure. going forward uh, at the university and what you think that brings to campus community in particular? You know, when I think of internationalization, I, I, I think about it on one level as kind of inputs and outputs. And so, you know, from an input perspective, um, I see the value in having uh, international students come from all over the world and really um, uh, contributing to the diversity of our campus as they come to campus. Uh, you know, in any given year we have anywhere from 80 to 90, 95 different countries represented on campus and um, that diversity I think really helps our university community to grow. It helps our broader community of Lethbridge to grow and to uh, see the value and, and importance of diversity. And so from an input perspective, I think uh, we see great value. From an output perspective, I, I think about our own students and how it contributes to, our, to um, the uh, experience of our students. And certainly having against international students on campus helps our own students to uh, have an international experience at home by getting to know uh, students from different cultures and, and to learn about those cultures and to uh, embrace uh, diversity as part of uh, their university experience. But at the same time also encouraging um, students to uh, leave campus, to leave the country and to uh, you know have a uh, uh, an experience in some way, shape, or form in a different part of the world. And I, I think from my perspective, it's important for those, um, those opportunities for our students to, to travel and have an international uh, experience to be uh, a diversity of opportunities because we have working students, we have you know, uh, single uh, parents that are students. So not all students are gonna be able to go off and, and you know, ha spend a semester uh, in another country. But, but many will be able to ha even have a two or three week experience uh, during the summer, um, that sort of thing. And so my goal for us is to build uh, a cross section of experiences so that as many students as possible can travel outside of Canada, can experience a different culture, can experience different languages, can be you know, faced with a situation where they're the only English speaking person in a room because we know that that's what our international experiences or international students experience when they come to campus. All of a sudden, everybody else can speak English. They can speak some, but I, I think it's, it's a tremendous learning experience for our students to have that reverse experience. And so I think as a campus, as a university, as we move beyond being 50 years and look to being 100 years, uh, growing from an international perspective, both uh, uh, recruiting international students, but also sending our students away is really important. Then the other piece of this is, is uh, faculty and staff. You know, I know you're soon off to, to uh, give an address in, in, uh, in China, and um, uh, I, I know this is a, f a first for you to, to, to speak to a, 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 an audience in, in Asia, and um, having done that myself, it's a tremendous growth experience to, to actually uh, do that, and I know you'll, you'll find that. And I would like to see as many of our faculty members have that same kind of experience where, where they have the opportunity to speak to uh, communities outside of Canada and talk about their areas of expertise, whether that's in teaching or research, uh, and also um, to share uh, knowledge, to, to share understandings and, and experiences. And then the, the other piece of this for me is uh, from a research and scholarship perspective, I think um, you know, when I see uh, the diversity of, of research on our campus and also the diversity of, um, of international uh, engagement uh, with other scholars around the world on our campus, I know that we're evolving uh, in a really positive manner as a, as a university. And I think uh, when you look at the, um, the really long-standing universities in this world that have been very successful, part of the success is that they have reached out that they have really seen diversity of experience for, for students, faculty, and staff as, as part of what it means to be a, an internationalized university. And, and I think that's a, that's a good aspiration for us. In January, I believe, you gave the Fiat Lux address, mm -hmm. uh, which is an annual address to the university community, sort of setting 
forward and a conversation about mm -hmm. something really important going on in the university. And we've just come off our 50 years of celebrating uh, the University of Lethbridge and its beginning and, and where we've been. And this address was meant to set us uh, the stage for going forward the next 50 years. One of the themes that you brought forward was equity, diversity, and inclusion. Yeah. And I wonder if you might tell us, what do you, like, what do those things mean? And how might we achieve them? Why are they important? All of those different types of questions. Sure. Well, you know, I, I'd start off by saying, you know, as it, as it relates to equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, there are multiple definitions of all three of those concepts. And in fact, uh, I think if you were to speak to uh, a cross-section of faculty members on our own campus, you would get def different definitions from, from each individual. So I, I would, um, first of all, not want to define what those terms mean for the campus. I think it's very important for the campus to, to understand those terms um, from multiple perspectives. So what, um, you know, what I've done is, is suggested that we need to understand, first of all, how are those terms being understood and conceptualized in, in the different corners of campus, in, in the classroom, uh, in you know, uh, student experiences, even in, in the residences, et cetera. And so that to me is number one. Secondly then is to, as we develop a better understanding of how people are thinking about these, uh, these concepts, then understanding what we're doing about them and um, you know the areas that we're maybe doing some good things and, and we might say that we're doing quite well uh, you know in, in say you know different notions of diversity and areas where we really need to um, to continue to, to uh, try and make inroads and, and uh, uh, make a difference I think there's no question if you know whether it's uh, uh, looking at um, how our prime minister is is strongly encouraging us to um, think about uh, notions of equity and inclusion uh, as a country. I chair the board of Universities Canada right now, and we've come up with um, a set of principles around inclusive excellence. And so we've provided a, a bit of a frame around what that means. But in the end, it really is about broadening uh, the opportunities for all people. So it, of course, goes back to my own. Um, sort of uh, thoughts about inclusion, which is, you know, in the end, really making sure every citizen has the opportunity to do the things they want to do, right? They have choices, and those choices are not restricted for them. And I think that's very, I, I think, sort of um, at a very simplistic level how I view equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, for individuals on a university campus that people have choices, that those choices are not restricted in any, in any way because of the nature of who they are, and that the choices are, are um, equitable. And so, you know, faculty members have equality in terms of the experiences they have as faculty members, in terms of the, uh, you know, their compensation, in terms of all these different things that um, um, make up what it means to be an employee. Similarly, students have equity of experience and diversity of experience that they choose to have. And, and so I'm hoping that over the next number of months, we will um, come up with a better understanding of, of, of our various interpretations of this, uh, that, we, that we understand where we disagree, because I think part of understanding um, from a go forward perspective is understanding where some of the roadblocks are because there's disagreement. And so it's very healthy to understand disagreement uh, because w once we understand disagreement, we can then start to try and tease apart uh, how do we get beyond disagreement to uh, solutions and strategies uh, to uh, you know, close that gap around uh, this whole area. So I think it's a, it's a, it'll be a great uh, growth experience for our campus to pursue this. It won't be easy, I, there will be disagreement, <laughs> and uh, there will be, you know, I think, uh, you know, I know some people are nervous uh, about the heightened expectations that it'll create too, um, you know, whether that be in terms of uh, opportunities provided, et cetera, but if we don't do something because we uh, feel that it's gonna create heightened expectations, uh, for doing the right thing than probably doing the wrong thing. So I think we really have to be brave enough to, to pursue this. And what about its um, impact on teaching? 
in particular, or how will this affect teaching? Yeah, well, I think that's up to people like you and and uh, all of us to understand what what is it, what does uh, inclusivity mean when it comes to teaching? What does diversity mean when it comes to teaching? What does equity mean when it comes to teaching? You know, I would say um, if I was to look back on the history of teaching styles the notion of equity has evolved right in the classroom right if we think about the place of the student versus the professor in the classroom and you were, were to compare 30 years ago to today the whole concept of equity um, in the classroom i think has evolved in a very positive way we have already tackled these concepts even without knowing we were tackling them uh, you know overtly and so i think um, these are important things to explore because when I think of diversity uh, you know, in the classroom, we can think of diversity from a cultural perspective. We can think of it then in terms of the level of, of kind of inclusion in relation to diversity in the classroom. We can also think about it in terms of diversity of teaching styles and diversity as, as it relates to how we uh, deliver curriculum, right? So uh, you know, that's the fun part of these concepts, yeah. I think, is that they, they, of course, exist on multiple levels. And that's why asking you know, me, the president, uh, to define them would be such a mistake because okay. it, in a sense that would be a very limited, I would argue, interpretation of, of concepts that are big and, and, uh, and deep and uh, important. You make me think about space on campus, teaching space yes. in particular. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think you're right that we've been moving forward towards things like uh, in increased equity in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, even between faculty and students, right? Yes, that, oh, that's that part we, of what I'm thinking yeah, about, yeah. And we become more collaborators and yeah. colleagues. Uh, and that's definitely not everybody's style. Like no, you say, no, there needs course. to be choice. Yeah. And some people like the lecture format, yeah. um, both as an instructor and as a student. Exactly. But as we develop things like the scale-up classroom models, the flipped classroom models, um, and collaborative learning models, uh, they definitely move us towards some of those directions yes, absolutely. as well. So. Yeah, I mean, I look at our, our destination project as a as a living, shining example of, of this commitment to, uh, of course, transdisciplinarity on one level and really encouraging uh, engagement of uh, folks from different disciplines, uh, you know, in, in, in different spaces, in different ways. But also, when you look at the diversity of, of teaching spaces in the Destination Project, it really is about creating diversity of, of, uh, of teaching experiences and learning experiences simply um, through the space that you offer and also then how that space is offered across disciplines creates an, a, another kind of context for it. So, I, you know, I, I, we're hopeful that the Destination Project will be a way to bring to life even more um, what I know we've been doing with uh, scale-up classrooms and this sort of thing. And, you know, um, I've always said, you know, space is not the the kind of endpoint solution for uh, good teaching, but it sure helps um, because we've all you know, had to try to, you know, teach in a certain way in a, in a classroom that really didn't work and, and, and may do and, and did the best we could. But we've known as we've had that experience as a teacher that, boy, if, if we had had a bit of a different space, we sure could have done this a lot better, right? And so I think um, teaching spaces is important. And, um, you know, I'm glad that uh, on this campus we have really tried to incorporate um, the whole notion of space is part of how we think about teaching because I, I think it is important. Well, and that leads, I have two questions I want to ask you about space. And But the first one, let's talk about the science and academic yeah, building or yeah. the destination project. And maybe if you could explain that transdisciplinarity and those different teaching uh, opportunities that might sure. exist within the building. And so what does that actually look like? And how are we trying to pursue those yeah. things? Yeah. Well, so we, you know, the, the, the whole basis of the building is, yes, this idea of transdisciplinarity. And, and um, you know, so as a concept, uh, transdisciplinarity goes beyond interdisciplinarity in, in the sense that we really are trying to encourage people within disciplines to not just talk to those in other disciplines and see where there might be points of collaboration, but actually get in the heads of people in other disciplines within their own sort of areas of, of inquiry as a way to really think about things differently, right? And so um, the building is really designed to create those sort of collisions of disciplines 
so that those kind of conversations happen. And when I think about this, I think of uh, two of our faculty members who come from very dif different disciplines. David Naylor, who's a physicist and uh, studies space, and um, Roy Goldstein, who's a cell biologist. You know, the story goes like this. They were having coffee one day and talking about their, their worlds, and David was talking about this, this telescope that he was uh, designing and, and uh, how far into space it was uh, going to, to uh, let him and others uh, look. And, and Roy was talking about the work he was doing in cell biology trying to uh, detect cancer cells. And they started talking about could you use the same technology um, that David was using to look into space, kind of flip it around and say, okay, rather than trying to look far, let's try and look close and see if we can detect cancer cells in a different way. And then you, uh, lo and behold, uh, that uh, work is going on as we speak up in Calgary. Uh, and so th that, that discussion over a cup of coffee is the kind of collisions we hope happen more and more uh, as a result of uh, the design of the destination project. The second piece of the destination project is very much about the, the, the spaces themselves and, and so how they are uh, constructed to provide different kinds of uh, delivery and so the laboratories are very much designed to be um, uh, labs that allow for student and faculty engagement so they're not um, they're not all sort of static spaces they're able to be moved around etc and so the students can have much more engaged experiences with their their student colleagues and their faculty members because of the nature of the space and them and really the mobility of the space um, the third piece is is um, the extent to which even the design in terms of uh, you know, where graduate students are located in relation to faculty members, the fact that at the end of each uh, sort of quarter there's, there's these beautiful open spaces for graduate students and faculty members to sit and have a cup of coffee and look out over the coulee. Uh, so the space is really uh, designed to create kind of inviting engagement between uh, hum human beings, which uh, we know is really, I think, uh, important, but also um, uh, creates lots of opportunity for creativity, which you know, in the end, is uh, so much of what we're hoping to to foster. And then, and then, lastly, I would say um, the space is also bold, and it's um, it's going to create some really unique spaces for people to experience. And to me, that's another part of the the creative experience in both teaching and learning is is having that experience with space that is inspiring. And I, you know, having just been in the, the space not long ago, there are some inspirational spaces. I mean, there are spaces that people will, will walk into and go, wow. And they'll sit on a set of stairs and look out over the coolies. They'll, they'll really have, I think, the opportunity to be, to be inspired by the space. And I think um, creativity and teaching and learning uh, are really supported by that. So I think all of those pieces, um, come together to, to create a building that hopefully will inspire great teaching and great learning. And then I, I think the last piece is that because it's also had a strong focus on environmental sustainability, um, it'll also be a, a building that's a role model for society and, and I think that's, that's a good thing as well. The idea of faculty and students sitting in these gorgeous spaces and having a coffee might sound um, elitist a in some esoteric, ways, right? Yes, yeah. right? But but that means that it's informal learning space, yes, right? So exactly. it's a really great opportunity yeah. to teach beyond the script in the classroom, right? Yeah. That you can really explore ideas, exactly. and go in different directions, and those learning one-on-one -on -one learning experiences that are really really valuable. And you know, I think you know, my hope is that um, this space is, and, and I believe this will be the case that this space is uh, inviting enough that it will it'll, it'll not just be science students that will be in this building. It'll be um, social sciences and uh, humanists. It'll be students from fine arts because it, it's going to be a very inviting space. It's going to be an inspiring space. And it's also in a, in a beautiful corner of, uh, of campus. And so um, you know, the goal, when we talk about transdisciplinarity, it's not just transdisciplinarity across the sciences. It's transdisciplinarity across campus, right? And so just as um, University Hall is a space from the very beginning that was really about, okay, all of these disciplines coming together. We hope the science and academic building will be the same, uh, and it will inspire engagement across disciplines. 
Right. It's very exciting that there's a brand new, enormous building. Yes. What's, what's its footprint to University Hall again? So, so it's 440,000 square feet, which is just slightly smaller than University Hall. Well, and both of these major buildings have been designed with that idea of the liberal education Absolutely. philosophy yeah. behind it, right? I mean, you know, the sixth floor of University Hall with those uh, platforms, you know, was, uh, was the 1968 or 69 vision by Arthur Erickson for collisions and, and conversations, right? And so we still have those platforms sitting there. And so I think it'll be very cool actually when the two buildings are open to, to sort of do um, a bit of a, a fun analysis of the different spaces we have between our oldest building and our newest building both designed to create, you know, the kind of conversations that we hope happen as a result of fostering liberal education in our curriculum. So student collaboration was another thing that we've been talking about, and it was mm -hmm. also a major theme in your Fiat Lux yeah. address as well. And we want to improve and expand those opportunities. From a pedagogical perspective, why is that important? It gets back to the whole notion of diversity, and, and that is that, uh, you know, I think as we, as we have you know, spent more time understanding learning. We have under, come to understand that, you know, learning happens um, in different, you know, using different styles, but, but through different experiences. And so the uh, opportunity for our students to be in the classroom and engage with, with student colleagues and, and with their professors is important. But I also think we know that um, being able to enable students to be outside of the classroom and experiencing, you know, various contexts where they can bring things that they talked about from a theory perspective or talked about in class discussions between uh, faculty and students, bring it into a different context and think about those same concepts, those same theories um, within a very vibrant um, sort of context outside of the classroom and frankly outside of the university. And you know then be able to bring those experiences back into the classroom again and, and have um, another conversation with faculty members, another conversation with student colleagues about how their, um, their thoughts have evolved um, as they have read about a particular theory, then experienced that theory um, through those discussions in the classroom, but then gone into uh, a different context and, and uh, seen it in action. I'll use one theory that just pops to mind. I don't know why this one pops to mind, but social exchange theory is a, is a theory that my wife actually used in her master's thesis. And social exchange theory is really about the theory of reciprocity. And so, sort of understanding how people engage in in um, in engage, engage in, in conversation, in uh, experiences with each other, and there are, there's always some level of trying to understand the reciprocal nature of that engagement, and that's really what social. Uh, exchange theory is about, and so I can imagine a sociology <laughs> student talking about social exchange theory, um, reading about it, uh, but then going into you know, a volunteer experience in a um, healthcare setting, and really thinking about social exchange theory by looking at doctors and nurses engaging with each other, by looking at patients and nurses engaging with each other, and then coming back and having a, another discussion with a faculty member about the kind of social exchange theory, social exchanges they observed, and how that does or doesn't um, match up with how, what they read about that theory. And so um, for me, it's, it, it's really about diversity of learning experiences as a way to help um, build, uh, build the person, grow the mind. And a great way that we could do that as well is experiential learning yes. opportunities for students. And um, I know that we, this is something that we've always prided ourselves yep. in, but I think that we've uh, recently undergone uh, the per, like a purposeful sort of yes. development of experiential yeah. learning opportunities. So who's, who's uh, in charge of these? Who's driving that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, I like to think that it's, uh, it, it's a um, distributed model, right? And so, um, what, you know, with the School of Liberal Education now um, being in place, uh, we see uh, a number of the experiential learning opportunities happening through uh, that school. Uh, so, that, so for example, the um, the U volunteer is now 
um, you know, being um, run out of out of the school of liberal education. So I think it happens. It will happen through that um, means. Uh, but we also know that we have co-op experiences uh, in our faculty of uh, or in our school of business uh, in our. Uh, Faculty of Arts and Science and right across the board. We also know we have practicum experiences for our, our uh, student teachers and for our um, nursing students. So it, it is a distributed model and I think that's a good thing because I think if we were to try and sort of wrap our, our uh, arms around it from one corner of campus, I think we would lose a lot. And in fact, I think that's why you know, there's great enthusiasm about the evolution of liberal education because it now is seen as a university-wide uh, concept driven by uh, the school of liberal education. And I, I think um, experiential learning, work integrated learning, all the different terms we use for, for enabling students to be out and, and experiencing the world uh, is best fostered through multiple um, uh, approaches and using multiple lenses. But at the same time, I think one of our goals needs to be to, at the same time, try to um, determine how best to ensure as large a proportion of our students can have a experiential learning uh, opportunity. And, and so that then is where I think we go back to the School of Liberal Education to say, what role can you play in collaboration with all of the faculties to really foster this as, a, as an aspiration for us as a university? And I think, um, I think there's, there's everything there to, to enable that to happen, but it's, you know, it's a work in progress. It's a, a bit iterative in, in terms of how it's gonna unfold. Right. Yes, and we need to develop a lot of connections and exactly. community yep. to create these experiences for students. One of the challenges of, of, um, of creating as many experiences for students as possible is just having a sheer um, number of experiences uh, for our students. So if we have, you know, 8,500 students and we want every single one of them to have at least one uh, experience out in the community in some way should perform that's a lot right so so that I think is uh, is a challenge for us doesn't mean we can't achieve it but it is certainly the challenge just for those who might not know about experiential learning and what that means uh, it's not just we're sending the students out to do work no. for somebody right no so I mean I think it number one it needs to be uh, connected to the curriculum it need, there needs to be um, you know, objectives for the experience and, and those uh, objectives need to be measured in some fashion so that we, we know that the student is actually um, having the kind of experience that is anticipated. You know, each one of these has slightly different uh, goals and objectives, right? So a co-op program is going to have a different objective than an applied studies program, than a U volunteer program. And so part of it is to recognize that there will be a diversity of, of, of these experiences for our students, but ensuring that within each we have you know a clear understanding of what the intent is, and then we we measure against that. And you know I remember um, in the 90s when I was a faculty member at, at uh, the University of Manitoba and had this as part of a couple of courses I taught. One of the biggest challenges was making sure that the experience that the student was having was not just going to some not-for-profit organization and and you know in essence pushing some paper around for you know the few hours a week that they had that experience but making sure that they really were having um, you know the experience that was intended and and evaluating against that but that does then come with uh, even greater expectation around how we deliver this right because it's not just sending a bunch of students out and saying um, have fun it's 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 ensuring that there is a real uh, structure and, and uh, it does connect back to the curriculum of, of either the program overall or a specific course. I'd like to ask you about um, the integration and the, the weaving of Indigenous ways of knowing into our classrooms. Mm -hmm. I know that this is a goal you've spoken of. I know it's a goal that many on campus have as well. Um, in some ways it's a response to TRC. Mm -hmm. uh, how are we moving forward in that particular direction? Yeah, so, you know, I think from an aspirational perspective, uh, the, uh, the, the goal of having greater indigenization on campus um, is I th very much uh, um, in part based on the call to action from the TRC, uh, also based on other 
um, you know, other aspirations articulated internationally, etc. How this happens, I think, is uh, is going to be um, institutionally specific, or I, I should say, should be institutionally specific. So we've talked about this nationally at, at Universities Canada. What does indig indigenizing the curriculum mean, right? Well, the reality is it means different things to different people and different institutions. And so I think for us as, a, as an institution, uh, it's really important that we um, foster a conversation using a Cuscany, our, our, our center, our indigenous center, as a means of fostering conversation about what that really means. And also that, um, because I, I, I think this is the case, that, that this can happen at different levels. It can happen in specific courses. It can happen across a broader curriculum. It can happen at the institutional level and, and understanding what that means. Uh, I also think that we have to recognize that when we talk about in, indigenization, it's not just about the curriculum, it's about the, the broader campus and our buildings, our, our, the language we use to describe things. It's about how we engage in research and uh, how we engage with research subjects. So it's, it's a very, um, very broad and, and diverse concept, and I think it's really important for the campus to have the various conversations that will lead us to uh, some, a, a variety of, of strategies and solutions that are U of L um, strategies and solutions, not Alberta strategies and solutions or Canadian strategies and solutions, and uh, and so I, I'm pleased that I know, um, you know, the the folks at Acuscany are, are are doing some good co uh, consulting work. Um, it, it will be important for the rubber to hit the road at some point, right? So, um, of course, we want to consult and we want to discuss, but at some point, we are going to have to sort of start getting down to okay, we know conceptually what we're thinking about. Now we have to actually try this out and uh, do a little experimentation, not unlike what we've done you know, over the years as we've, as we've evolved liberal education or we've evolved um, experiential learning. At some point, you have to actually get some things happening. And I think that's gonna be necessary for us sooner than later so that we can you know, experiment, try some things and, and get some feedback on you know, what does it mean to you know, sort of infuse indigenous concepts into a course. Some we do already, you know, we have courses in education, in, in business, in, in fine arts, et cetera, et cetera, uh, but some not so much. And so I think understanding what that looks like and what the scope of, of opportunities are is gonna be important. So since we've been talking about your Fiat Lex address and moving forward by 50 years, mm -hmm. um, what do you think are uh, the most important ways that we can move forward as an institution in supporting teaching excellence on campus? From a teaching excellence perspective, it, I think it, it starts, first of all, at a um, kind of an institutional level by um, articulating that as an aspiration. And so I think it, it does start um, it really do, has to be a, a core part of our vision and mission and, and uh, what's articulated in our strategic plan and our, and our academic plan. And I think we've done that. I think there's wor uh, good work on that front, but I think we're going to have to continue to challenge ourselves to, to um, think deeply about this as we move forward. Um, and I think ultimately, as we evolve as a comprehensive university, our, our concepts of teaching have to be be at both the undergraduate and graduate level. So we have, to, we have to not just think about teaching from an undergraduate perspective, we, we have to think about it at a graduate perspective. And I also think, and this is I think where we're, we're not yet, but I think we should be trying to get to the point where we don't think about these things in silos and we think about it in a more integrated fashion because I think um, we will evolve as an institution, as a comprehensive university, uh, in a very productive way. If we can have conversations about great teaching and learning um, at the undergraduate and graduate level in an integrated manner. Because I do think the future of, of teaching and learning is about thinking about um, the integration of students across the undergraduate and graduate uh, uh, um, sort of context. Many exciting things happen 
um, in the classroom and outside of the classroom uh, that include both undergraduate and graduate students. Not always and, and not you know, in, in every uh, situation, but I think the health of, of the discourse about the sort of coming together or lack thereof of, of the undergraduate and undergraduate experience will be enhanced by thinking about these things in a, in a collective or integrated manner. And, and I think our conversations are not yet as refined on that front, I would say. And I, I really hope that, that we're able to get there because I think um, thinking about it either or is, is part of the challenge because it always then sends us to sort of a, a space where we think about, you know, okay, what, 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 what should we do or do we need to do at the undergraduate level to kind of protect it as we grow as a, as a graduate university? And I, I think that's the wrong frame. I think it's what can we do to support the undergraduate and graduate experience in a collective manner? Because it's not, it's not the case that we have you know, one group teaching undergraduates and one group teaching graduate students. We have people doing both. And so how do we support you as a faculty member in history who we want to see um, having really positive engagements with your undergraduates in history and your graduate students in history. How do we support you in that manner? And how do we do it so that we can also support our students in that manner? And I think some of it is, is supporting them to engage uh, with each other in, in really healthy ways. And we've, we see this uh, happening already, but I think that's where, where we really need to go. Well, and I know that you've spoken about doubling the number of graduate students on campus. and. So what does that mean? I mean, integrating the concepts. So when I think of a, a really uh, healthy uh, environment for undergraduate and graduate students, I think about an environment that, that values both the undergraduate and the graduate experience, number one. So it's not an either or, it's a, it's a together. I think about recognizing that it's really important to ensure that our undergraduate students are not sort of uh, second class citizens that only uh, receive um, you know, experiences from those that you know, um, don't want to do other things so we stick them into the, the classroom that it really needs to, we need to embrace the value and importance of really strong undergraduate student experiences. In a related manner, I think we also um, should have conversations about what graduate students can bring to the undergraduate experience in a very planned and um, intentional manner. Not, not just because we're struggling to find somebody to teach uh, you know, a class and we you know, last minute say to a PhD student, oh, by the way, we need you to teach uh, this class or this class. In a much more intentional manner, thinking about how could we design um, a program in, in each of our disciplines that looks at the integration between the undergraduate and the graduate um, experience that potentially even has shared experiences, right? I, I mean, I think we have tended to, um, you know, separate out the undergraduate and the graduate experience as, as needing to be completely separate from one another. I'm not actually so sure. One of the greatest classes I ever took was a, a class in, in the Department of Psychology at the University of Manitoba that was in a, a, um, a research methodology called single subject design. And we had undergraduate, masters, and PhD students all in the same class. And I was a faculty member. Uh, I was a lecturer. I was just working on my PhD. So in fact, it also had, uh, I was, you know, the, 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 um, so the, the single um, uh, lecturer. And it was an amazing experience. And I know, I remember talking to the undergraduate students and you know, them being blown away by having this experience, being in the same conversations as, uh, with some doctoral students. And so I think we need to sometimes thinking about blowing up um, the sort of boxes that we have around how we provide experiences to our students and thinking about this notion of having a bit more integration across uh, um, the, the, of course, the disciplines, as we've talked about earlier, but uh, even across uh, the, the undergraduate and graduate uh, milieu. Yeah, and I do think that there's a little bit of that already going yep, on on there campus. Is. The Institute for Child New Studies, yes. for example, has these great student seminars where yep. people pitch their papers or their thesis chapters, and uh, undergrad students are invited in as well for right. child-related topics. And 
you know, they can give their term paper and then get feedback from a multidisciplinary perspective yes. from students at all different levels. And it's it's an, exactly, I think, what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. So. And, and you know, I also think about this in terms of how we um, support our, our graduate students, especially at the doctoral level, but even at the master's level. Uh, I think, you know, we have to be far more intentional about providing experiences for our graduate students in teaching, right? That this is not, again, you know, sort of looked at as labor that we use if we need it, but it's in fact looked at as how do we provide opportunities for our graduate students to be involved in the classroom? Because uh, number one, it's good for them, they're gonna grow as individuals, but number two, I also believe strongly, having done it myself as a graduate student, that the undergraduate students really enjoy it, especially if it's intentional, not if it's a last minute or, you know, this is just, you know, your, your TA that, uh, you know, grades your paper, but that we have, this is my, this is what I'm talking about when I talk about integration. It really is a intentional integration across uh, the different levels of, of education. So I have one last question for you. Do you miss the classroom? Oh, absolutely, I do. Yeah, you know, when I was a dean at, at the University of Alberta for a decade, I, um, I taught undergraduate students, but I, did, I could never teach a full course just because of my schedule, but I did lots of, you know, undergraduate teaching uh, sections, and I worked with a lot of grad students. I had grad students all the way through, and I finished my last doctoral student uh, here at the L for my first two years. Um, I got to meet him. Yes, I'm, I know. And in fact, I just was in Australia with him. Oh, uh, good. He's teaching at uh, University of Western Sydney, and so yeah, I, I, I got a chance to visit him. And it's always cool to see uh, your graduate, former graduate students be successful, right? So uh, I miss uh, teaching from a couple of uh, um, uh, perspectives. First of all, I just really enjoyed teaching and, and uh, spending time with students in in the classroom, outside of the classroom, in, in sort of the different contexts that we created. And, and um, I was always pretty good at it. I, you know, I, I think it was, it was kind of came natural to me, so it was a fun thing to do. But secondly, I really um, also miss um, the, the level of uh, mentorship and friendship that um, uh, you, you develop with uh, your students at the undergraduate and graduate level. I mean, I still have, um, you know, former students that I'm in touch with that I taught in, you know, in the early 1990s, right, 20 whatever, five years ago, and, you know, get baby pictures from students and that sort of thing. So, you know, you don't get to do that as much as a, as a university, pre university president. I mean, I, of course, I get to know lots of our students, but not in the same way that you do when you, when you teach. And so I miss, uh, I miss that really uh, human part of the, 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 the um, teaching experience that uh, you know, I think those of us that love teaching uh, really enjoy. I can relate, definitely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Yes, well, thank you. It's been fun.